So again, welcome everybody. Uh, talking about printing photos tonight, and this is a topic that I'm I'm uh, I, I get pretty excited about. You know, the old I love the old saying: "It's not really a photo until you print it." Um, so as as you folks here can see, I, I like making some big prints and hanging them up in places. Uh, my wife accuses me of of uh, buying a second house in Vermont so I'd have more places to hang my photos. So. So uh, I, li I like to print them. So um, one of the most important things in printing is getting consistent results. Uh, printing is a uh, printing is a bear. I mean, it's a it's a real it's a real pain in the ass. And, and once you get a system down and get consistent results, is is essential. And so, oops, let me get back. Forget what I was working with here. So the key to start with is is the monitor. You ha you have to have a good monitor. Now, if you use a laptop, and especially if you're a Mac person, that's a horrible, horrible monitor for trying to do color because it is set up to be very bright, very vivid. Uh, colors are oversaturated. Brightness is way too bright, and so. Uh, I use I use a a Mac laptop with an external monitor, and so the external monitor I'm able to calibrate and able to to make sure that the color is consistent and and fairly uh, fairly normal. The big problem is there's no standard for what normal is. So so uh, you know it's all it's all about. Uh, just figuring it out. But if you're if you're looking for a monitor, you want one that's an IPS monitor, which stands for in-plane switching, which I, I've read what that means. I don't know, I don't care. All I know is if I'm working on photos, I need an IPS monitor. And every every manufacturer makes IPS ones. Uh, they hold the color better, the blacks are better, you can look at them at an angle better. And so uh, if you're getting a getting a monitor, go with an with an IPS. Uh, then you need to calibrate your monitor. And so uh, Color Monkey is made by x uh Data Color makes Spider. And it's basically just a little, little gizmo, about like this, and uh, cost 150 to 200 bucks. And you, you put it on the machine, and it's got software. You put it on the monitor, and it, it reads the monitor. And it will make your pictures look, or your screen look dull and flat, because that's what it really needs to look like. And so it's like, oh no, my pictures don't look nearly as good. Well, they do, but your screen isn't overly saturated, overly bright, overly uh, vivid. So uh, using a, a calibration device of some sort is essential, and you need to do it. I, I do it pretty much every time I'm doing a major. Uh, editing job or a major printing job, I recalibrate. And it sometimes looks different, sometimes it looks the same, but at least I know that it's, it's calibrated the same. The bad thing about calibration, again, is there's no standard. So what the, what the calibration is really doing is setting your monitor to be the same every time. It might not be the same as, you know, if I have a monitor here and a monitor at home, they probably aren't the same even if they're the same brand. They're probably not exactly the same. But once I figure out what monitor is that's hooked up to my printer, I can, I can uh, get a consistent result. You can spend a lot more money and get calibration devices that will calibrate your monitor to your printer and be able to figure out what your color is doing all the way through. Uh, I don't bother. Uh, I have a, I have a, 44 inch Canon printer, which costs a hell of a lot of money. Um, should I upgrade and spend another 500 bucks on a calibration? Eh, maybe, but I'm getting pretty good results because I have a good feel for what my, my monitor is doing with my printer. So, so I, have, I don't do that. Um, but you, you, you need to do something. Uh, I mean, I think Windows has it built in now too. Macs have built in calibration which doesn't do a thing 
and, uh, you know, it's, I don't know what they, what they're calibrating to. They don't know what they're calibrating to. So uh, stay away from, stay away. Don't think that the, your software that comes with your computer will do it because it won't. It won't do what you want to do anyway. Um, then you need to think about profiles. It doesn't get simpler. It just does not get simpler. So there are all kinds of profiles and profiles are, are uh, not created by, but uh, um, uh, standardized by the International Consort Color Consortium. So they're called ICC profiles. And you have profiles for printers, you have profiles for inks, you have profiles for paper. So if you buy a, an Epson printer, use Epson inks, and Epson paper, you don't have to worry about profiles too much because it's going to talk to itself all the way through. But if you bring in a different brand of paper, a different brand of ink, which I highly don't recommend, um, then you need, to prof you need the profiles. And paper is the most common thing that people change around. Uh, like say, I have a Canon printer now, and I will only use Canon ink. Even though I can find cheaper ones some places, I'm never going to put anything in that thing besides can and ink um, for multiple reasons. One, it's cheap and who knows what it'll do and the color might not be consistent and, and it's uh, just not nearly as, as good and I need good. So uh, anytime I try a different paper, the paper manufacturers have ICC profiles online that you can download and incorporate into your workflow. We'll, we'll talk later about, uh, we'll show you in Lightroom where they, where they are and how they vary. But you need to have the proper profiles for everything all the way through the system or else you're gonna be in trouble. So proofing is, is extremely valuable. So what you see on a, any computer screen, you will never get a print to match. Can't happen. Computer screens are, for one, different, different ways of displaying color. It's projected light rather than reflected. And when you print something, it just doesn't have the color of the pop, the sizzle that a, a computer screen has. You can't do it, no matter what you're doing. So you have to have a proofing system so that you can see what, what is going to happen. I have a TV monitor here at the gallery that is uh, an LG OLED, which is the best TV monitor I've, I've ever seen. And the blacks are black and the colors are just vibrant. And when I have clients in looking at, at photos, they'll look at one on the screen here, then look at what's on the wall. And I can see their heads kind of twist and I immediately am on them. You can't judge a color by what's on the TV monitor. This is what the print's gonna look like. So um, it's, it's always a tough thing. And so um, one of the problems with, with proofing is, is the gamut of the color. So gamut is the range of colors that can be displayed or printed. So everything has a gamut. And that's how, much, how many colors can you see? You know, an old, an old, uh, it, it, the, the first uh, uh, color computer monitor that I had had 16 colors. <laughs> that was the gamut. You could choose which 16 it was, but there's only 16 colors on that thing, right? And, and the early web pages had 32 colors, I believe it was. You know, you only had so many colors you could use on a web page. Well, now you have a much wider range, but different, uh, different image types have, have a different gamut. So sRGB has is, is become, unfortunately, the standard for what pictures are displayed on the web. So when you export a photo, you, you have a choice of what, what color profile you want to use or what color uh, you, you want, want to have uh, displayed. Uh, sRGB is, is the low end standard. And so all websites can see it, see all the colors, uh, and, and most monitors can see all the colors. Uh, Profoto has a, a wider gamut, so it has more colors. But if you try to put a Profoto picture on a website, 
some some monitors won't see all the colors, then it looks really weird, and, and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, browsers won't work with it. Uh, sRGB is, uh, like I say, the standard, and then there's Adobe RGB. So Pro Photo is has the widest gamut. So if you're sending your photos to a lab to be printed, when you export them or or you save them out of Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever you're using, you should check with your print lab and see what what uh, type of files they'll take. Will they take a Pro RGB? Hopefully they will. That way that you have the widest gamut available. Um, part of the problem with, with, I mean, so, so different types of paper have different gamuts, different inks have different gamuts, different printers have different gamuts. Um, when, I, when I worked in the newspaper industry, uh, newsprint had just a, you know, a dinky, dinky gamut. And, and I'd always be back in the press room fighting with those guys about, you know, you can pull more out of that, and, and you know, and uh, fortunately, I knew what I was talking about most of the time, and they knew that, so they'd, they'd work with me, but, but the gamut is, is a, a real pain in the ass. So, if you're, if you're printing, when you first fire up that printer, you, you want to run a gamut test and see what the, what the gamut is. So, this is a, a, a test file that I downloaded from digitaldog.net, whoever the hell they are, but they put together a real nice gamut test file. Um, so when I print this, I can see what colors are, are not working for me. What's not happening here? What, where am I losing color? Where am I losing detail? What, what ain't working, right? And then I can adjust my photos to, to stay within the gamut of my printer. Now my monitor has a, a gamut my printer has a different gamut, right? So the gamut of the monitor is much greater than the gamut of any printer. So what does that mean for us? Well, um, a photo like this has a hell of a lot of color in it, right? And a printer is not gonna print all those colors. So how do you know that? Well, one of the keys is, uh, I'm gonna adjust my screen here a little bit so people here can see hopefully, what I'm talking about. Okay, so um, I, am, I am always looking at photos and trying to figure out what's gonna print properly, what's not. I know that these bright oranges are not gonna print that bright, right? This deep, deep blue purple up here is not going to print that, that, that deep. Uh, there's a little bit of detail showing in the in the black here. I'm probably going to lose that because when we're printing, when we're printing, it's ink going onto paper, and so there's some swelling of the dots. And so the way printing works is it's literally shooting out itty bitty little dots of, of ink. When those itty bitty little dots of ink hit the paper, they expand. Now the better the printer, and depending on the paper surface, how much they expand is critical, right? But if you have very, very fine detail and you try to print it, it that is gonna, gonna clog up and you're gonna, you're gonna lose that detail. So I know that detail that I'm seeing deep in the, in the uh, dark areas here is not gonna print. So you know, I've got a little bit of detail there which to me is absolutely fine. I don't care, I love my blacks black and I love to plug them up, I don't care. Uh, there are people who, who say, oh, you've gotta have, you know, you can't, you can't clog your, your blacks, you've gotta have detail in the blacks. Well, I like the punch that happens when I, when I block them up, so, so I let that happen. So a shot like this, I might actually end up choosing a different photo shot at the, about the same time because I know this one's gonna print truer than the first picture, right? So there are times when I really have to decide, can I make a, a really nice print of that? And, you know, and this one, I've got a lot of detail happening here. Am I gonna hold that detail? Well, some of it, but some of it's gonna, gonna go away. Um, and I actually would probably tone this one to, to darken that up and lose that a, a bit in there but I'm still gonna have some problems over here in this bright, bright colors. 
Um, and I'll show you in, in a bit how we decide what, uh, how to decide what's, what it's doing. Um, so on a black and white, you don't have, you don't have the gamut problems that you do in color, which is why I love printing black and white. Uh, but even then, you know, you're still going to lose some detail in the blacks. You're going to lose some, some shadow detail. Um, you're going to lose some, uh, some of the, the crispness and sharpness that you see on, on the screen. Um, so how do we tell what, what's going to print and what's not? Well, within Lightroom, there's a, a pretty easy way. And the, the ultimate printing machine is Photoshop, uh, but it is just complex. So I'm sticking with Lightroom for this. Um, and I print, I print almost all of my photos through Lightroom rather than Photoshop. The print engine is the same. Um, there are things you can do in Photoshop that are crazy high end that you can get a little bit more out of the photo if you need to. You know, for me, it always comes down to how's it look? You know, does that print look damn good? Yes. Okay, then I don't need to do anything else to it. I don't need to dig in deeper and, and make, you know, oh, you know, or, you know, I, I hear guys like, oh, you put, you know, you do this and you get the distometer and you get the numbers and, you know, those numbers. And I say, can you see the difference? They say, yeah, I don't know. Well, I don't care about the numbers. It's all what I see. So, um, so when I, when I go to the develop module here, I can come down and click on soft proofing. And right away we can see that the, maybe let me close that window and make things a little bit bigger. Go away, thank you. So when I hit soft proofing, I then am telling it what profile of paper am I using. And so right now I, I use a, um, we're gonna talk about different papers later, but uh, my, my go-to paper is a, a Burita semi-gloss. And so when I select that, as I don't know if online will be able to see the difference, uh, from that, from a, a matte paper, you can just see the colors, colors are changing as, as the profile is, um, is changing. And so when I use, so this is what I print my banners with. You can see that is just a flat look. Blacks are gone. Uh, doesn't look nearly as well, or ne nearly as nice. Uh, this is uh, a canvas paper. So again, on canvas, you're not going to get nearly the detail you do on a on a glossy paper. So, um, so you have a in in Lightroom, you have a gamut warning that'll tell you. Let me come back down to my. San Gabriel. So in the upper right corner, when I move up here while I have this soft, soft proofing set up, when I move my cursor over that or I can click on it, that's telling me all the colors that are not going to print as seen because they're out of gamut for that paper. When I look at that, my first thought is, holy shit, <laughs> right? I'm in trouble. Now, the problem is you can't tell how far out of gamut you are. Are you just a little bit or are you way out, right? Um, so that, that's, that's a problem. So on the left side is your, is your monitor gamut. So what turns blue is out of gamut for the monitor, which is pretty interesting that, wait, I'm seeing something. How do I see that? But, I don't worry about the monitor gamut. I'm only worried about my printer gamut. So I have a couple of choices. Um, I can I can change my intent, or do I have this later? Oh, sorry, we'll get to that later. Um, yes, I have that later in, in text. Um, so some people think that this is just a uh, false alarm warning because when you print anything, the printer software, whatever is controlling the, the printing is going to adjust for the gamut. So it's not gonna, if it's out of gamut, it's not gonna not print something. You know, if I've got these oranges and reds up here that it can't print, it's still gonna make them orange and, and red and green, 
but it's just not going to be as bright or as as vivid as this. So if I want if I really want to make sure, I'd create a, a proof copy, which is just a virtual copy. And now when I when I work on that part, so if I come down to uh, vibrance is where the problem usually occurs. As I back my vibrance off, my gamut problems go away. Now, when I look at that photo, I go, ah! <laughs> that doesn't look anything like what I saw, but uh, that could be how it prints. That could be how it prints. So, uh, Photoshop has a, an even uh, more accurate gamut warning system. Uh, and of course, it's more complex. So if you're, a, if you're a Photoshop person and you're not using the gamut, gamut alert system, uh, you should. It needs to know your printer profile to do that. Absolutely. It has to know what printer you're using and it has to know what paper you're using. Right. So that, that I told up here. So this is a, a profile for for my my uh, San Gabriel and the Canon printer. So the paper companies, the profiles they create are for each individual printer. So they have a whole list of them for each paper for essentially every printer out there. Um, and uh, you know the the gamut is is the biggest thing we have to worry about by far. And so in, in uh, Lightroom, let me, let me go to another photo just for hoots and hollers. It's not quite as vivid. Um, you can simulate your paper and ink by clicking this checkbox here. And so you can see when I'm, after having soft printing, soft proofing checked, this photo is pretty close. Now let's see what our gamut warning is telling us. Okay, so, so we're, this color is of the moss down here is not going to look that color. That's what it's telling us. The sky is holding pretty nice, so I, I'm more worried about the sky than I am that that green color. So a lot of printers have trouble with greens. Dark greens are a problem for a lot of printers. Um, reds are a problem for a lot of printers, which is kind of interesting. Um, so do you try to fix the image so you don't get gamut? Do you try to fix the image so you don't get gamut warnings? Um, uh, it depends. I don't a lot. I, I will check it and see what's looking. I've printed enough that I can look at a photo and pretty much tell what it's going to do. Um, if you do, you know, the, the soft proofing is, is trying to simulate what it's going to look like when it's printed anyway. So, um, you know, the difference between that and, and that is is really the difference of the, of your what your printer is going to kind of look like still it's more vivid here um i think a better way to do it is make a test print of this one you know so if i'm making a if i'm making a big print first i'm going to make a a, a print that wide it's only three inches high and and hit it in a in a, a critical area of the photo and see what that looks like. And then I'll make some adjustments, maybe using a virtual copy, and then make another test print. So let's see which test print looks best. So, so how do you actually uh, create a virtual copy and then reduce the size of the image to just that test print level? No, I want, I want the test print to be the full, the, the full resolution or the full size. So if, it, if I'm gonna end up making a, a 16 by 20 print. Right. However much that enlargement is, is what I want the test print to be. So I can also see if I have any noise or grain problems or, or sharpness problems or anything else. So Jack was just telling me that he, he ordered a, a shiny print, a metal print from, from a place down in Florida that I recommended. Uh, they, they will sell you for $12 an eight by 12 or so metal print, test print. Right. If you just send them the full file, they print just an eight by 12, which doesn't tell you much. So what you have to do is you, you make an enlargement in Photoshop, is the easiest way, that is the same percentage enlargement and have that eight by 12 as a, as a uh, piece of the, uh, the test print. 
That door open over there. Not anymore. Thank you. I don't think it's Thank you. photos printed the way they wanted to. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Too too much gamut on the kids there. <laughs> um, so so I want my test proof, whatever size I make. You know, it doesn't have to be three inches, but but I can usually tell on a three inch print how three inch. You know, if I make it a forty four inch print, it's three inches by forty four inches. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's the full the full enlargement essentially. So you just cut out so just, a strip of the so, photo where you think there's good information that you'll right. So essentially, I'm cropping the photo and just leaving three inches. Yeah, that's what I was getting at yes. in terms of I, I didn't I was having but, trouble but with communicating right. it clearly. Yes. But, okay. Yeah. How do you how do you load a uh, profile into photo um, into Lightroom so that you can find it? Because right now when I click mine down, it shows Adobe and a couple of others, but not my printer, even though my printer is installed and everything. Um, how do you how do you pull them in? Just a second here, my throat's going nuts on me. Yeah, that's in the in the print module, um, which we'll talk about here. Um, you, um, my brain just went out on me. Where do you load them up? My brain went out on me. I'll, it'll come back. I'll come back to it. Wow, that's terrible. <laughs> Once you said it, forget it, right? You no, know, once I, but yeah, I do it all the time. Wow. I'm getting old. I'm getting old, losing, losing my brains. You're not the Lone Ranger. <laughs> don't you no. Know, by the end of the night, if I don't if I don't come back to that, holler at me, and I'll I'll, I'll hopefully bring it back. So this is a picture I shot last week, and I know when I print this, you know I'm just loving this blue, but I'm not going to get it. You know, it's just it's going to hopefully be close, but uh, but I'll pull some test prints. I'll make two or three test prints before I make my big one and and make my adjustments to it, and then just see what it see what it does. See what see what the you know what adjustments I have to make uh, because if I looked at this in under soft proofing, you know, um, it's going to tell me my gamuts, you know, which is not horrible. You know, that's not horrible, horrible. You know, at least I'm not losing all this nice color in here. It's, it's this dark, rich, super rich color that, that I'm going to be losing. So when you, when you see that, that red color gamut warning, does that mean that it's blocking up in that so that it's just not going to show the level of gradations between the colors? Yes. Yes. That's exactly what it means. Okay. So you're not going to have the gradation. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to stop at some color and not give you more colors. Yes. Um, same thing here. Look at look at what's happening to my nice yellow green. <laughs> <laughs> so this one might end up as only a, you know, I'll print it and see what it does, and, and and it'll still look pretty cool. But I I know that these colors just don't print. They just don't print, no matter what I'm printing on. Uh, up in here, I'm in pretty good shape, but that yellow green there, just too too vivid. All right. All right, frustrating. This is from Brooklyn, you know. Look what happens here to them. My reds just go away. I mean, they don't go away, but they just don't get, right. they, just, they just aren't as vivid and, and vibrant as, as I, I want them to be. So, Warren, yes. you're showing us the picture in the gamut, but what about, in the gamut represents the proof. So when when I'm proofing, so the question is, what 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 is the gamut showing me? So it's showing me a warning of where I'm not going to print the colors that I want to there. Uh, it, my colors are not going to go as intense or as as vibrant as what I'm seeing on the screen right. when I get the paper. Right. That's what it's showing me. And the only way that you can see that is by developing proof, right? 
Right. So when I make a print, you know, if, if I'm printing this at an eight by 12, you know, I'm not gonna bother making a five by seven proof. I'm just gonna blow through an eight by 12 piece of paper um, and, and see how it looks. And then, you know, I see people holding prints up by the monitor and trying to, okay, is that what I got? Well, you know, that's one way to do it, but you're not gonna get off the monitor what you're on the print, what you got off the monitor. But you can see where, where is it? Where am I not getting it? Is there something I can do to adjust the, the vibrance or the saturation or in, in that individual color even? Okay. You know, if, so a picture like this, rather than lowering the vibrance on the whole thing, I'm just gonna bring down the, the reds. You know. So your f final print is gonna be on the same paper that you tested on the A512. Right, was... right. So the final print will be the same, same exact, everything all the way through. Do you ever try to change the paper to see? If oh yes, absolutely. So, so let me just turn on the gamut warning here. So if I, this is my, uh, my Burita semi, semi gloss. When I come to a mat, you see my gamut changed. Picking up, well, I'll, I'll go back. Watch, watch as I point to my screen here, like anybody can see my finger on the screen. Watch down in this area around the, the back end of the car as I change color, I change profiles. Okay. And if I come up to the, wow. that's a canvas, right. That's a metallic paper. So you can see how the, the profiles change. And so, yeah, if, if you're, you know, we're going to talk about paper in a little bit, but some pictures you want to put on a matte paper, some you want on a glossy paper, some semi-gloss. So that's one, one way to help you decide. This seems really unfair. <laughs> um, it's, you know, I, I wish I could say it wasn't complicated, but it is. No, it, it, I mean, it's that it people just work so hard to get the colors and, and everything, and, and then you go to print it, and, and it's not what you got. It's something else. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, it, and it's and always, it's always yeah. been that way. It's never been fair. Um, it's like, like, that's, you know, the, the, you know, National Geographic photographers who used to shoot Kodachrome hated seeing their pictures reproduced and nobody <laughs> reproduced better than National Geographic, but they would just go nuts. Go, oh my God, I ruined my freaking photos. You know, no, you got the best reproduction there is in the world. What are you talking about? Come look at my newspaper, you know? Um, and but that's why a lot of people shot color negative film versus color slide film because color negative film didn't have the vibrance and the punch and the, the whap of the, that slide film did. And when you made a print, it printed better than slide film. So, so Lauren, are you changing the virtual copy or are you changing the original copy? Original copy is good. Um, yes, so I will make I will make a virtual copy to be used for printing on paper, and I will have a copy for printing on screen. So I will tone my photos different for the screen than I do for print. So if I'm going to put something on on my website, it looks different than that file is different than the one that I'm using to to make a print that's hanging on the wall. Yeah. And do so, the labs have a different success with getting the colors that you intended? Do I have different success? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm at the point where I'm, I think I'm pretty, pretty consistent with, with what I'm doing. Um, you, know, you know, a picture like this one that we're seeing, yeah, there's some color there that's, that's not going to be that vivid. On paper, I, I have to live with that. I don't have any choice. Um, do I change my shooting because of that? No. And do I change my processing because of that? Yes. My processing for print, absolutely. Mm. Because they print better. Yeah. And that's what it all comes down to is, well, what's it look like when it's printed? Mm. You know. 
I, I, I'm, I'm not much of a braggart, but I have some pretty nice looking prints hanging around this place, you know? Cool. Um, and it, it's because I've taken the time to learn the steps and, and you know, and Ooh. figure out what, what, what do I need to do to a print to make it, to make it work. For instance, uh, there's some detail on the back of this car. Mm -hmm. Darker things don't print nearly as well as lighter things. So I'm going to lighten that part. Of, if I want that detail to show in my print, I have to bring that out. Whereas as for a screen image, I don't need to bring that out. I can let it just kind of hang out there in the shadows. So as, as I know that shadows clog up and, and build up, if I want detail in there, I have to go in and, and dig it out for the print version. I can't have nearly as much contrast for print, unless I'm going black and white. It'll so what you're print. really saying is, you've got to develop a print, a photo twice, if you want a web copy and a copy on a copy that you print. Yep. To maximize your printing, you do. Hmm. Now, will it look good enough if you don't? Maybe. Maybe. Is maybe okay. Maybe depends what you're doing with it. You know, if you're just making an eight by ten to, you know, of of, uh, of your dog, well, that's probably that probably is okay just to let it let it fly and not maximize it. Hey, my dog got a fence. Yeah, I know. I like my dog too. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's it's a different thing. So when you have something develop, say like a Costco, there's a radio button you can check. Says something to the effect that you want them to to adjust it. Are they going to look at the profile and do that soft proofing thing and then make sure the cannon matches? Oh check? God, no. Uh, so the question is, when when you send a print to like Costco and they they depends. Now I I I know the guy. His name is John Doe, who prints Costco's uh, canvas. He has he has a crew out in California that looks at every photo that comes through and they manually maximize that, that image to print the best that it can, which is absolutely stunning because he does 1.2 million photos a year. And, and the people sit out there and, and, and boom, most places just, they'll, if, if they're gonna maximize the color, they have an auto button, point, they hit the auto and, and it, it brings everything. Um, do they worry about the gamut? Not at all. You know, they're printing what they can because they're they're mass producing. Now, if you're using a pro lab, and and they're going to hand hold it, you know, they're going to manually maximize that photo. Then that's that's part of their concern, and they still know some things are going to be out of gamut. I mean, you're always going to have something out, but it's it's how much and how bad. Is it worth asking them? Could they email you their their IC? Yes, so a, a, a good lab will be able to send you a, an ICC profile for their printer and the paper they're using. Yes, absolutely. And so you can plug that into, if Lauren can, his brain would let him show you how, you can plug that into Lightroom or Photoshop, and then, that, then when you soft proof, you're matching as close as possible to their printing system. Absolutely. Question back here? So if you pay extra hmm. production, they're going to try to maximize the image? Yes. The yes. So in the case of Costco and, and the canvas, they, this John Doe only prints canvas. Um, they look at the photos, and if they, if they determine that a professional shot it, they won't touch it. But if it's an amateur, and, and I sat there and looked at thousands of pictures over a couple of days out in California, it's pretty easy to tell the difference. Uh, they they uh, they don't touch the pros, and they they go in and, and work on on the uh, ones that look like they came from amateurs, and 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 the pictures come out better. And I said, so I said, John, why the, why the hell would you bother doing that? And he said, because if people send me a photo, and and I send them a print that looks better than what they sent me, they're really happy. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. And they're gonna buy more prints. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, so, you know, even a, a photo like this, um, as I'm soft proofing, you know, 
I'm, I'm pretty much in gamut except for the green down in the grass there. So this, this photo, I don't have to worry about, you know, do I, you know, that, that green is electric anyway. So, you know, I probably over processed that anyhow. So I, I could back that green off of there and, and, and still, you know, look better in on uh, online too. So, uh, you know, so when I look at a picture like that, I don't even have to worry about the gamut because I know I'm, I'm within, within my limits there. So this photo looks way over processed. Shot it with the iPhone, right? And the iPhone on it. I just did this last week too, so I haven't looked at the gamut. But you know, I, where I figured, I'm I'm in my sky. I'm you know the orange and the yellows are are way too much. I'm this whatever color blue this is down here is going to be too much. So so uh, interestingly, you know. That's not horrible. That'll that'll tone down. So if I just backed off the vibrance, so let's just turn the turn that on. If I just back the vibrance down a little bit, my gamut problems go away. Okay, no, no, undo. I didn't mean to click that. So it'll create a proof copy just by clicking there. Okay. Any, any other questions on the gamut whole thing? I mean, that, it's it's uh, fairly complex, but you Warren, I just it. have a quick question about where the where the virtual copy is stored and and how you know the difference between the two. Okay, uh, uh, very simple. A virtual copy is is stored right beside the other one. So if you're in the grid mode in Lightroom. The virtual copy shows as has a little corner turned up in the lower left corner. It looks like a page is turned up. So you can see that. And yep. if you have multiple ones, it'll say one of two or two of two. Uh, but the so this is this one's the original. This one's a virtual copy because it has that little corner in the uh, little icon there in the corner. Hi, Lauren. It's Sonia here. How you doing? Hi. Hi. Um, I've lost the image all i see is a black screen with you speaking in the corner it, what oh, do i need to press okay. on to get your pictures back um under view options uh are you seeing oh what's it if, if she's seeing just a little uh box just click there's like a little arrow inside of it if you click that that usually expands it back open in, in i see like <laughs> Lauren, I see Lauren speaking in a yeah, so look 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 in the bottom, Do you bottom see right hand gallery corner. Gallery view or or um what's the other one called? Yeah, gallery view. Click yeah. that. Yeah, click that and I see like, you know, all the other people. Do you have so as as a as as boxes going back and forth or yeah, across yeah, the, yeah, like, up like, and down, yeah, up and down on the right hand side. So I see the right all the other people that are in the room. View options. It's just black. I've just it was fine, and I've then clicked on something, and then I lost the actual photos, which is the fun part. Yes. <laughs> and do you see a green arrow on the bottom right hand corner of your of the little screen that's open? No. Oh, okay. I do not. Um. Uh, while while we're talking though, Lauren, I found out how to load the uh, color profiles. Oh, thank the, uh, you. <laughs> Refresh you my... click other. When when you go to um the profile, okay. click other, and then it brings up everything that's loaded into your computer. Okay, we'll go look at that in a minute. Sandra, did you did you find the? No, button? no, I don't want to hold you up. I'll just okay. um, I'll figure it out for next time. It, it, it's either gallery view disconnect or, and uh, and reboot and, and join it again. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll disconnect. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's go back to. Uh, how do we pull in the? It's over in the print. I can't believe my brain is still dead on this. Where did you say that was? Under 
So go up to where you have your profile, upper right-hand corner, and I just click oh, wow. profile itself, and then you click other, and it brings up a list of options. Click on the profile, paper profile, when you select Kufin. Yeah, click right there. Now hit click other. There you go. But, but that doesn't that doesn't import them into Lightroom to start with. Um, I think it does because if you, I selected my printer and the paper that I have, and if I change the paper, I can see how the print would change. Right, so, right. But if you're if you're downloading a profile from a website, right, then it would show. It down, should, here, here's the key: when you download a when you download a profile from a website, they'll have instructions on how to install it. <laughs> they do. No, they, they, they always do. Lauren, you might uh, have to copy the profile into a specific folder in Windows. In, yeah, in Windows and Mac is different. Yeah. Uh, I was working with a person yesterday trying to get some profiles in. and uh, I'm, I'm a Mac person. I haven't worked Windows for a while. and The Windows instructions were different. Let's just put it that way. Um, okay, so let's talk about resolution then, which is uh, an always fun and confusing thing too. So if you're going to make a print that is four by six inches at 300 DPI, how big a file do you need? So, so DPI means dots per inch or dots or pixels, I'm sorry, 300 pixels per inch. I'm in, an old, in my old print mode. Um, so, so a photo is made up of individual pixels, right? So a computer screen has 72 pixels per inch. So if you, if you enlarged it with a magnifying glass and counted, there'd be 72 pixels in, in every inch. When you're printing, you need more pixels than that per inch in order to have a smooth graduation of, of uh, your, your picture. So if you magnify any printed thing really, really a lot, you'll see that it's made up of a whole bunch of little dots, right? And so how many dots you have determines how sharp and, and how uh, much color you have and, and uh, the more resolution in theory, the better, okay? So if you're doing a four by six inch print at 300 pixels per inch, then you need to have a file that is at least, uh, four by 300 or 1200 pixels on the four inch side and 1800 pixels on the six inch side. Four times three or, or four times 300 or six times 300, okay? So it needs to be at least 1200 by 1800 pixels. So 12 by eight, 1200 by 1800 equals 2,160 or 2.1 megapixels. So to make a four by six inch print that at 300, pixels per inch, you need a 2.1 megapixel file, okay? This is math, that math sucks, right? <laughs> so if you're jumping from a four by six inch print up to a 16 by 20 inch print, do the math and you end up with a 28 megapixel file, 28.6 or 28.8, okay? What does all this mean? Well, if your camera shoots a 20 megapixel file and you want to make a 16 by 20 inch print at 300 pixels per inch, you're probably in a little bit of trouble. Okay. So there is a, a maximum size at which you can make a print. Now, a lot of printers will tell you, or a lot of people will say you need to print at 300 pixels per inch. I'm here to tell you, you don't. Um, a lot of them are at 240. Still, you don't need that much. Um, I've tested my printer and I can get down to 150 pixels per inch on glossy paper and I can't see any difference. Um, the guys who do my metal prints down in Florida, uh, the, uh, they came from uh, not the photography world, but the reproduction world. And they are, they are reproduction geeks and so I was talking geekness with them and they will print some of their metals and maybe they want me to tell them at 125 pixels per inch and if you don't like them 
look at what I've got hanging on the walls and it's amazing. So you can get a much bigger print out of your file than you think you can. So if you're printing your own, my recommendation is run some tests. And when I got my new printer, the first thing I did was made a print at 300 pixels per inch. Same file, dropped it down to 240, dropped it down to 150, dropped it down to 125. Well, 125, I wasn't liking the looks of it. 150, damn, that looked pretty good. So I normally do it at 240 just to make sure I have plenty. But you know, if you're printing your own, now when you send to a lab, what are they gonna do? It depends. If it's a custom lab and, and it's a, a fairly high end, they're gonna work with you. If it's, if it's not, if it's a mass production lab, they're gonna say, we need whatever their number is, 240 pixels per inch. And anything you send them below that, they're gonna say, it's on you. You know, we'll print it, but it might not look good. And it depends what you're printing on. Canvas, my friend John Doe, who is not my friend, and if anybody's online, I hate John Doe. Um, no, I, I don't, I'm not a hater, but I hate John Doe. Um, and I, I have good reason, if anybody wants to hear the long story. Um, he's printing canvas. Uh, he'll, he'll print them at 100. He'll print them at 90. And you can get away with, on canvas because of the surface texture a much lower resolution. So if you have a small file and you want to make a big print, go to Canvas because it'll hold up. It'll, it looks okay. Now, the other thing with resolution is, on a print, is viewing distance to the print. So if you see a billboard, most of those are about eight pixels per inch. If you ever see a billboard up close, it looks like crap. But you're not viewing them up close. You're viewing them from 200 feet away and they look good. So. You know, that's the other thing about printing is how far away are you when you're going to view it? So if you know you're going to have one that's hanging behind the couch and people can't get within 10 feet of it, you can, you can get away with a lot more than when people are walking right up to it and going, ah. Yeah. So if you have the megapixels, is there any advantage to printing at a lower DPI? Is there any, if you have the megapixels, is there any advantage to printing at a lower DPI? No. So speed. Speed. But you generally still go with 240 instead of 300. Yes. Yeah. I can't see any difference. Or, no matter what I'm printing on. Curious. How much of a difference does that make as far as the you no, know, we're talking about a you know size prints here. At 240, what is how much of a difference is that making? Well, that's a so the question is how much difference is it making at 240 over 300? It's a math. It's a well. I mean, f size size wise, yeah, absolutely, it's pure math. Um, but what's it look like when it's printed is is the question. So if you're sending a proof file, you know, you want to have it being relative to the 240 or whatever size you're sending them. So if you're sending a picture out, if you're sending a file out to be printed by a lab, they will have most of the good labs have a chart. And here's the lowest you can get away with. Here's the ideal. And here's uh, eight by 10. Uh, here's what you need to have to get in that, in that range. So they'll tell you what, what size you need to have. And you, know, you can talk to them and say, oh, I don't have quite enough file for that. I'm, I'm making a huge file. But as you can see, even with a, a, a 20 megapixel camera, you're, you know, 16 by 20 is no problem at all at 240. You can go 20 by 30, pretty easy. Um, I mean, well, actually, the, the, I have a photo here on the wall that was shot with a Canon 5D Mark II, which was a 24 megapixel, 22 megapixel camera. And that's a 72 inch print. You know, that looks, you know, there's, there's a couple in here that are six, six feet long that look pretty good. But again, it's on canvas. If I was doing that on metal, it might not it might not hold up that big. So it's all a it's all a uh, a give and take. So I don't I don't want to lead you down a, a path you don't want to go down, but uh, there are ways to uh, resize your image pixel wise. There are, uh, and there are pros and cons associated with it. But it's you know that's maybe for another topic. 
Well, so the comment is there's there's ways to resize and upsize is what the what the term is. Uh, when you're upsizing, if you're adding pixels, where are they coming from and where are they going, right? So if you have, you know, it's it's interpolating, you know, well, we need another pixel in between these two. So this one was blue and this one's red. What color is that one supposed to be? So he's like, he's like, that's not just like what I can, I can change the tag on the, on the file, whether it's a 240, it's still going to be the file is because this many pixels by this many pixels. Right. But he's talking about something separate where you can actually enlarge right. the, right. the number so, of pixels. So if you have, if your file is 30 megapixels and you need it to be 40, right. you can tell yeah, it. And then it's got to fill in the crank it up and it's something intelligently. It's right. right. It's filling it up with something. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I used to program with um, Pardon me? I think it's Adobe that does a megapixel program to increase the pixels on the image. Yeah, there's there's several programs out there that do that. Um, it wasn't great. It was okay, not great. Re results are, yeah, results vary. You're, you're much better off, you know, anytime you send a picture to a lab, send them your full image size. Don't downsize it at all, even if they say, you know, make it this size, send them the whole damn thing. Let them, let them worry about it because they're, you know, their software is made to, to do that. Um, so you don't have to worry about what size it is. Um, so send them the whole, send them the whole thing. Question? Yeah, um, I, I'm really a novice at this, so. Okay. To some extent you're talking Greek to me, but in any event, um, where do I find out how many pixels my file has? Great question. Um, if you are a Windows person, you click on the photo in, what, what the hell do they call it? They just call it viewer. Just go to viewer. Right, right, click. Right, right click on the photo yeah, out of your view, desktop. View details and then you can click through some tabs right. and it'll show you the resolution. Right, so. view, t v view details and there's a tab there that will say or properties. Properties, or something and, like yeah. yeah. Uh, same thing on a Mac if you, if you just, uh, uh, click on the photo, right click and get info, or click on the photo and command I get info, it'll tell you the file size. If you're using Photoshop, uh, it's pretty easy, but. but and, that, that's if, and that's if I'm in Lightroom, I do that in Lightroom? No, Lightroom does not show you your file size. Okay. No, okay. it's one of the, one of the things in that the irritates me. Does, does it, if you go, I, I don't use Lightroom, but I, I use Luminar, and if I go to export my file, it'll the, the resolution shows up before I actually export it, so I can see what, what the resolution is going to be. You, when you export from Lightroom, you can tell it what resolution you have, but it won't tell you what you have, you, right. what you're starting with. Gotcha. So. You can look in the metadata. In, well, in your metadata, it does, yes. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you, it does. So in, in the library, you're right. I'm, I'm not thinking there. So if I if I just click on it over here in the metadata, dimensions, 4,032 by 3,024. So you can tell that one's from my iPhone. Uh, this one's from my real camera. So you can see now I have a much bigger file from my real camera at 8,086.88 by 57.92. So I have a 52 megapixel camera that I use from for my, my files here. So that number, we would just have to multiply them by each other, or do you have to multiply them by 300 first? And no, those two times each other tells you the mega, the megapixels of your file. Perfect. Thank you. Cameras are designed by pixels. Cameras. So files are are. So the pic, the size of your image is determined by how many pixels are per inch and how how many inches that file is. Or right. So, so different different sensors will create a different size file. Yes. Hey, Lauren. Yes. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, off this might be I don't know if it's on topic or if it's off topic, but in terms of shooting between like JPEG, Fine, and RAW, how many? How much does that factor into pixels? A lot. A lot. A lot. Um, uh, you always want to shoot the biggest file you can. So if you're shooting JPEG, whatever whatever your brand of camera names the biggest file possible, you want that always, always, always. Uh, uh, a raw file, 
and the JPEG file in theory have the same dimensions, but the, the JPEG has been compressed, so it's thrown pixels away. So raw files give you the most possible, but if you're shooting JPEG, you definitely want to shoot uh, the largest file, whatever designation they have for that. When I first started shooting RAW, I played with it, and, and the, the RAW file was 25 megapixels, and then the JPEG that the camera created at the largest setting was only five or six megapixels. Yeah. So it loses a lot of data. Right, it loses, that's, that's all part of that. Okay, so. Quarks that will tell you how many pixels you need to produce a print in a particular size. So how many pixels, so that's, that is dependent on the, uh, the printer. So uh, if you're sending it out to, be, to a lab, they will, have, they will be able to tell you. There'll okay. be a, usually a page on their website that says this is the size you need for this size of. Right. Um, right. Um, but uh, if you're printing your own, it's just waste some paper and see what works. You know, that's what it really comes down to. So uh, inkjet printers have two different types of, of of ink. Uh, a dye uh, based ink is uh, uh, a, a water based. Um, most inexpensive printers, you know, any just regular inkjet or dye based. Uh, a pigment is uh, decided and, and they will fade in five to 25 years. But a pigment based ink uh, is more permanent. It's archival. It'll most if you're using it with uh, uh, archival paper in the last 70 years or 90 years, depending on it. Um, and it will give you a, a much uh, deeper black, a nice rich black, and uh, you get much better results. So uh, if, if you're buying a, a printer for photography use, you probably want a pigment-based printer. The inks cost a lot more money, but, but they're better. Uh, paper types, uh, different kinds. Watercolor gives you the look of an artist, a matte or a or uh, uh, um, uh, uh, smooth paper uh, has a, a nice look. A, a glossy will give you the sharpest possible print. So if you want super sharp, you use glossy paper. Uh, I like a semi-gloss Burita. Uh, I, pretty much everything hanging here is, is printed on semi-gloss, uh, which is a, a, a Burita, which kind of mimics the, the good old fashioned uh, print out of the dark room. So, that's, you know, that's, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Get back up there. Um, and so a, a picture like this, uh, I might print that on, on a mat because it has just really nice smooth tones, uh, nice soft feel to it. But a, a picture like this, I'm probably wanting a little more punch than I'm gonna get from a matte print. So I'm gonna get a richer black with, a, with my semi-gloss, with my burrito, or, uh, or a full gloss. Uh, so it depends, you know, what kind of paper you use depends on what your photo is looking like. Yeah. Where's, where's the rag fit in? Oh, uh, where's a rag fit in? It's a, it's a, usually a smooth paper. So it's more of a, of the watercolor, watercolor and soft matte type of paper. So you use a Hanamule, right? Sure I use a Hanamule uh, matte. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fine art rag, which, yes. Which looks damn good. And it holds the blacks really well. Sometimes the matte, you don't get a, a good black, but, but th that's a pretty expensive paper and it, it, it works really nice. Uh, so I, I was, you know, thinking about archival. Archival means it'll last probably 70 years and acid-free is the best kind. Um, so there's a, there's always the question of sharpening and how much sharpening do you do? And it's season to taste. But if you're going to use a matte paper, you need to do more sharpening than you do with a glossy paper. Uh, so uh, sharpening should be the last thing you do before you print. That, especially in, in Lightroom, that way you can see what, what it's doing. And you know if you're printing to a matte paper that you need to, you can get away with more, more sharpening. Uh, it really comes down to uh, if you print it and you can see that it's been sharpened, you did too much. So go back in, back it off, and make another print. So you can, you know, when, as, as you sharpen, you, 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 know, you see the, the detail come to life in the picture.
So then there's a whole one more thing that's really confusing in, especially in Lightroom. So as we go to a print module, it's, it's who's controlling the, who's controlling the printing, the software or the, or the printer. They both will, they both will want to do it. So if you're making prints and they are consistently dark, they're consistently way dark. That means you're probably telling it that both the software and the printer shouldn't be managing the print job. Uh, here in color management by uh, in Lightroom, uh, the profile is set up to be managed by the printer or you select the individual profiles for whatever type of paper you have uh, set up. Uh, with my Canon printer, I'm better off having it managed by printer. Everything I read says you're better off having it managed by the software. But I ran my tests and I like my prints better when it's managed, when my color is managed by the printer. Because with this printer, I, down, I have to download my profiles to the printer. So it has, you know, it has a computer in it that is, that is handling all of that. So uh, I have a, 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 a cheapo printer. Canon printer over there. That one I have Lightroom manage the, the color. So it all depends on, on what I'm doing and, and what, uh, what kind of printer I have. You know, if you spend a lot of money on a printer, then it probably has the smarts to, to do the management. Uh, and like I say, if, you, if, you're, if your color is way off, you probably, there's a couple of places where you can tell it who's managing the color. You're probably um, having them both do it and, and then it's a mess, it becomes a blob. Okay, uh, that's all there is to printing. <laughs> uh, what about perceptual versus? Oh, we didn't talk about perceptual and, and so um, when you're managing uh, printing or, or uh, your intent, so uh, perceptual uh, is working with the gamut and it's trying to preserve the visual relationship between the colors. And so colors that are in gamut may get changed when the out of color, out of gamut colors get changed. Okay. So it, it's changing all the colors. The relative uh, renders, uh, uh, preserves all your in gamut colors while only adjusting your out of gamut colors. What was that called? So it's called uh, uh, perceptual or uh, um, relative. relative rendering. So here in, if, if I was, managing by that, I, I have my choice of perceptual or, or relative. And you should choose relative. Right? Where usually, are you? Usually. I'm here in Lightroom. I'm in the print module. But you also see that when, I'm going to go back to here, when you're in the develop module up here in, uh, and you do, you're doing soft proofing, yep. you, you can see the difference between relative and perceptual. So when I click on perceptual, see how the colors change? I don't know if you're online, you can yes. see that. Show us again. Yep. So as I click back and forth, you'll see the colors changing. Yep. Yeah. Let me, let me turn off the, if I turn oh, okay. off. Okay. So look, look at the greens behind the people sitting here. Look how these greens change, depending on which, which type I choose. And it's doing this. Yeah. So that's again, as, as you play with it and see which one's working best for you. Uh, I'm, I'm tend to stick with the relative and, and uh, uh, because I want my in gamut colors not to change when the out of gamut colors are changed. So how do you go about exporting an image that you have a semi cooler at? How do I export an image? Um, so the question is how do, you, how do I export an image and I'm gonna send to a lab. So if I was gonna export this one, let me get back over in the library module. Um, I'm going to hit export and I'm going to choose, uh, you know, I, I want to do my sharpening not here. Uh, I only do that when I'm uh, um, don't going for screen. Um, so here's where I choose my color space. So if I can, I want to go pro photo RGB. That gives me the biggest gamut possible on the file. Um, and I, I want to do a TIFF file rather than a JPEG or a DNG. JPEGs are compressed, which means something's getting thrown away when you're, when you're exporting. So if you do a TIFF, you don't export. 
not every lab will take a TIFF file. The lower end ones don't want to mess with, it creates a much, much, much bigger file. And so uploading that can, can be problematic. So. Uh, can you set your camera? My camera, you can choose if you want S, sRGB and OBRGB in the camera. And you choose. Yes. The problem with, with not using sRGB is um, websites, web browsers might not view it. So if you're using Pro Photo or, or Adobe RGB, sRGB is the standard. Uh, if, you're, if you're shooting raw files, it doesn't matter. If you're shooting JPEGs, it does. So it doesn't matter what you're shooting in the camera, if you're shooting raw files. Right. Then you just, when you... You're getting it all. Right. And when you export it to the lab, go with the biggest one you can that they'll accept. Exactly. You're going to export the software. Well, you're not going to export the proofing. Um, you're, I mean, when you, Which file so, you so the, the one that I worked on for, for print is the one I'm going to export to them. Yes. Yes. So when the signal, your, your filter is lower, lower on ink, say less than 50%, would that change the color output? It shouldn't. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Your ink should, shouldn't, you know, unless they're really old, if they've been sitting there for four or five years, then maybe they're losing some color, but no, that shouldn't, that shouldn't matter. So Lauren, um, yes. So I've done everything. I've I've edited it, looked at it, did all what you talked about, right? But I'm not sure what I'm doing, right? So I then send it to say a pro lab. Mm -hmm. Is there an option to review it and make those final adjustments? Depends on the lab. So they may they might make a proof print for you and send it back to you. Of course, they're going to charge you. Um, or they're just gonna bang it out for you. So it, it you know, depends on, on where you're getting it printed and, and uh, how much money you wanna spend, really. So uh, for, say, a decent size, I'm starting to print, what service would you use? Well, just so happens. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. Uh, uh, so there, there are several labs, uh, Nations Photo Lab, uh, MPix, Miller's is the MPix, uh, Adorama, whatever they now call themselves, uh, is the lower end of that. Uh, they all do good, good pro quality work. Uh, I am doing master printing here now too. So if you have a picture that you want and you know you want it done right, uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing printing. Uh, there, there's... Uh, information about that on my website, uh, which is not why I did this seminar, but, uh, but. Sign me up, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's info, info. Um, if you're looking for Costco prices, I'm, I'm not the place. Uh, uh, and, and frankly, Costco does a hell of a job printing. Sure. Um, uh, just don't do your canvas there because John Doe prints those. Um, <laughs> and his name really is John Doe. Uh, but, uh, but they, you know, they use, you know, so, some stores have their own labs and they clean their machines every night. The one in Bridgewater here is, does a, a, a great job on, on prints. Um, they're not going to be archival though. You know, they're, they're the machine prints. Um, but you know they do they do metals and they do a pretty nice job on the metals they they do the you know they don't do the the metals at the no they send those out no right. they, they use a, a place in seattle i believe for that so one last question on the export module you got your 45 megapixel image mm -hmm. um and the lab says we don't accept something that big when you find a different lab yeah <laughs> <laughs> Will you be able to send them by an email a 45 megapixel image? No, most labs will have an uploader through their through their website, so you're not using email. You're you're uploading directly. So for those computer geeks, it's an FTP upload, which of course Lauren Photos has an uploader, so you don't have to don't have to email it um, because yeah, you can't email systems don't want to deal with big files. Now, am I correct when our email is can your email service provider downsize that photo? 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, I hope not. I hope they don't. They don't mess with it. I think typically they just they'll like Gmail will have like a, a limit for file size, right. and if your file is too big, they, it won't go through, yeah. and they'll force so, you to share it another way. Right. You know, or you, you know, Dropbox it or something. Mm -hmm. So there's 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 more better ways of doing that than email, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, when you were talking about uh, what if you make a proof, you would want to send it at the same size as the as the large one that you're going to have made. So I'm a little confused. So if I have like say in Lightroom, you, you do your cropping and say it's a two by three crop, you know that's also a four by six. Yep. So you can when you tell them you have that crop, so you tell them you know I want you know four by six, but it, it's two by three or even bigger like nine by twelve. Or whatever. So you can't do it in Lightroom. Yeah, you, can't do <laughs> you can't do what you're trying to do in Lightroom. You have to go to Photoshop to do that. Oh, okay. Right. You resize it so essentially, you're you're opening it the size that you want to make the print, and then you're cropping out wherever oh. it is in the photo that you're and wanting that, to. Is that in like canvas size? Is that in the canvas size? Image size. Image size. So you start with canvas size, then you crop down to image size. Yes. Can you um, demonstrate what you do with a picture? that has the gamut warnings. How do you adjust that picture so that uh, it works? No. <laughs> Too much time. Okay. Too much time. Um, I mean, it's just, just a matter of, usually I start with uh, vibrance, if, I, if it has too much vibrance, saturation. But uh, again, you know, the gamut warning can be a, a, a scary alert that's too much. So you, you just need to know that these areas probably aren't going to print the way you, you see them on the screen. So if you're printing, especially if you're printing your own, just print a test and see what it looks like rather than, you know, before you, you know, before you ruin the look of the photo, just pop it out and see, well, that just doesn't look so bad. So I'm not going to screw up the whole photo to fix that one little area that's got some you know, out of gamut area. I know there's a lot to this, and uh, you know this could be a 12-hour seminar, but uh, just wanted to give you an overview and and uh, something to chew on because there's plenty of chewing to be done, plenty of gnawing and hair pulling. Well, when I set up the printer the first time, it's, you know, hopefully the neighbors have their windows closed because I'm I'm saying some words. <laughs> Any questions, anybody online? Okay, thank you very much. We'll thank see you, you next. Thank see you, you next time. Thank you.